Hi everyone, happy you could join me for this lecture. I've got a little Ted over here who's going to be hanging out in the room uh, listening to your lecture as well. I hope you're all uh, doing quite well and uh, hope you enjoy this lecture. So let's get into the lymphatic system and immunity. All right, first things first, we need to talk about the function of the lymphatic system. The first and foremost function is going to be fluid balance. So this is going to be where we have excess interstitial fluid entering the lymphatic capillaries uh, and it becomes something called lymph. Lymph is going to be the fluid that is left over from the uh, cardiovascular uh, system uh, exchanging items through their capillaries uh, and that fluid is left over in the interstitial tissues. So when that fluid is then picked up by lymphatic capillaries, it is then turned into lymph. So if that fluid didn't leave the tissues surrounding the capillaries, the cardiovascular capillaries, it will cause something called an edema. An edema is going to be where you have uh, fluid within that tissue, and I'm going to spell out edema here, and I know my handwriting is going to look like garbage, uh, but bear with me. So it is an edema. Edemas can cause tissue damage, and if left unattended, they can cause death. Um, so that is going to be where you have swelling in various tissues. The next function is going to be lipid absorption. This is going to be the absorption of lipids or fats and other substances from the digestive tract via something called lacteals. These are going to be lymphatic vessels that line the digestive tract and the lymphatic fluid that you're going to find in these areas uh, is going to become uh, be called chyle. So that word right there, chyle. And then the third function is going to be defense. So this is where we have microorganisms and other foreign substances uh, being filtered from lymph by lymph nodes and from the blood of the spleen. Uh, this is where we're going to get things like lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are going to be one of those white blood cells that I actually know uh, earlier in the semester. Uh, it is a type of uh, immune uh, system defense cell. Um, so many infectious diseases are going to produce symptoms associated with the lymphatic system, and that is where these cells are going to come in handy. So going through a few of the anatomical structures within the lymphatic system, um, first and foremost is going to be that fluid uh, lymph. Uh, we have our lymphatic vessels, which is just kind of a broad term. We have lymphatic tissue, which is going to make up those lymphatic vessels. We have lymphatic nodules and lymph nodes. Uh, there is a difference between those, and we'll go through that. And then we have a few organs, uh, the tonsils, the spleen, and the thymus. So something I want you to picture, and I kind of alluded to this before, is uh, as fluid moves through and out of blood capillaries, so the cardiovascular system capillaries, into surrounding tissue, the excess fluid enters the lymphatic capillaries and then becomes lymph. And then through all of these anatomical structures, we are going to have the movement uh, and the transference of lymph from the lymphatic system back into the cardiovascular system. We'll talk about that. So more on lymphatic vessels. These are going to be essential for fluid balance. They are going to serve the purpose of carrying lymph away from tissues and into the lymphatic system. They are going to originate with lymphatic capillaries. These are going to be small dead-end tubes. So not dissimilar to the cardiovascular system 
uh, capillaries. They are the smallest version of the lymphatic vessels. They are more permeable than blood capillaries, and they have epithelium functions uh, that is going to act as a one-way valve. Valve, And I kind of think of it as like, if you've ever seen a crab cage trap, uh, it's kind of a, uh, you go in one end and you can't leave. It kind of shuts behind the animal um, so that it traps the animal in the cage uh, and makes it to where it cannot leave. And that is the way this epithelium in the lymphatic capillaries is going to work. It is found in all parts of the body except for the nervous system, bone marrow, and tissue, uh, tissues without blood vessels, such as cartilage, the cornea, and the epidermis. Um, capillaries, do keep in mind, are going to be found in most tissues, except for a few of these that we've already mentioned. Uh, and it's going to be, um, again, far more permeable than blood capillaries. Uh, the movement of lymph is through the vessel is going to occur via these three points here on this uh, page. The first is going to be the contraction of the lymphatic vessels, the second is the contraction of skeletal muscle, and then the third is thoracic pressure changes. So this slide very nicely shows uh, on the left an illustration of how you have an arterial, a venule, a capillary bed, and our lymphatic vessel, specifically our lymphatic uh, capillary, and how we're going to have the fluid in that interstitial tissue. So we have those tissue cells uh, floating, floating all about. Um, there is going to be fluid uh, within these um, structures and then outside of them as well. Uh, so our capillary in green is going to be taking up all of that extra fluid within those tissues. On the right, you can see how that epithelium on the outside of the um, lymphatic capillary is going to be working kind of in that little, uh, as I said, a crab trap uh, way where fluid is going to be entering into the lymphatic capillary and then that area will shut behind the, uh, the fluid as soon as it enters that capillary. And moving down through the capillary itself, it's going to have these valves that just like with veins is going to keep the fluid moving in one direction and not have any backflow. So valves are going to be found in the lymphatic system as well as in the veins. All right, moving on to a few more lymphatic vessels. Um, so again, our lymphatic capillaries are going to uh, eventually join to form lymphatic uh, vessels that are going to be larger. Uh, lymphatic vessels, uh, again, are going to have valves that ensure a one-way flow, as I said on that last slide. Lymph nodes are going to be distributed along vessels and filter lymph, so that's a big important uh, function for lymph nodes. We have lymphatic trunks, which are going to be associated with the jugular, the subclavian, the bronchiometanastinal, of course I probably said that horribly wrong, and then intestinal and lumbar. Now what lymphatic trunks are going to do is they're going to drain into possibly any of those vessels that it mentioned or they will drain into the next lymphatic vessel, uh, the lymphatic ducts. Those ducts are going to then drain the tissues of the body and move lymph into major veins. Now the lymphatic ducts are going to uh, include the right lymphatic duct, duct, I keep saying duct like quack duct, and the thoracic duct. So the right lymphatic duct is going to be just draining what is on the right side of the head and the right upper limb and the right thorax, so the right kind of upper chest, if you will. The thoracic duct is going to remain, or uh, I'm sorry, drain the remainder of the entire rest of the body. And I do have a small picture on the next slide that shows just that. 
So it's that bottom right picture of the woman in uh, anatomical position, and it is showing the areas that are being drained um, into those uh, specific spots and where they are draining from. So that right part of the body, which is kind of a smaller section, and then the entire left side of the body and the entire lower uh, inferior portion of the body is going to drain into that left lymphatic trunk so or the uh, thoracic duct if you will what this is also showing is um, lymph draining into particular veins um, it is just going to feed directly into those veins themselves um, so that fluid that lymph after it has been filtered will just enter back into circulation All right, moving on to lymphatic tissue and the associated organs with the lymphatic system. Lymphatic organs are going to contain lymphatic tissue. Shocker, I know. Uh, but this lymphatic tissue is going to include mainly lymphocytes, as well as macrophages and dendritic cells. So lymphocytes, um, remember, are a type of white blood cell, are going to be split up into B cells and T cells. So do keep in mind, as we talk about B cells and T cells, these are just a two, two different classifications of lymphocytes. They are going to be white blood cells that are derived from bone marrow, where all blood cells are going to be uh, created from. But many will mature and reside elsewhere, especially when it comes to these lymphocytes. The tissue is going to be made of fine collagen reticular fibers and produced by reticular cells. They are then going to act as a filter to trap microorganisms and other particles. This is going to essentially create a net that is going to uh, filter. So it's kind of an interesting little thing. It just creates a, its own little filter by using these reticular cells um, and lymphocytes in order to filter out that lymph. These various tissues may or may not be encapsulated. Ones that are encapsulated are lymph nodes, the spleen, and the thymus. Non-encapsulated are going to include the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, or MALT. This is going to be found beneath the epithelium as a first line of attack against invaders. Where we're going to find these types of non-encapsulated lymphatic tissue is going to be the digestive system, the respiratory system, the urinary system, and the reproductive system. So um, malt, as an example, is going to be an example of uh, diffuse lymphatic tissue lymphatic nodules and tonsils. So these are going to be, I'm sorry, I kind of phrased that weird. Examples of malt are going to be diffuse lymphatic tissue, lymphatic nodules, and tonsils. And then one little thing about lymphocytes uh, before we move on here is that when the body is exposed to microorganisms, lymphocytes are going to divide and pro essentially proliferate. Proliferate. Woo, words, guys. That means we're just going to increase in number to become part of the immune response uh, and thus destroy invading cells. All right, I did mention diffuse lymphatic tissue on that last slide, so let's talk about it. Diffuse lymphatic tissue is going to be dispersed lymphocytes, macrophages, uh, that are going to blend with other tissues. It is associated with other types of lymphatic tissue as well. So one of the things I want to get across is that it blends with other tissues, and that means that there's no boundaries between um, the diffuse lymphatic tissue and the other types of tissue. It kind of blends all together. Talking about lymphatic nodules, these are going to be denser aggregations, so accumulations, um, and you can see in that picture there that we have diffuse lymphatic tissue and it's just mixed with the other tissues around it, um, and the lymphatic nodule is very distinct. 
It is going to be more numerous in loose connective tissue of the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive systems. Again, that is malt. Uh, we talked about those before. But when it is in the digestive system, it is known as a pyre's patch, a pyre patches. Um, these are going to be aggregations or clumpings of lymphatic nodules in the distal half of the small intestine. We are going to refer to these as lymphatic follicles uh, when they are found in lymph nodes and the spleen. Moving on to tonsils, uh, the tonsils are going to be your very first line of defense uh, when it comes to ingesting things. There are three groupings of tonsils, the phar pharyngeal, uh, which is going to be if you remove the uvula, so the soft palate, and took a peek kind of at the uh, just behind that uvula. That is the pharyngeal tonsil. You have two palatine tonsils. Those are on either uh, side of the mouth, kind of just before you enter into the throat. And then you have a lingual tonsil, which is going to be just behind the tongue at the very, very back. The purpose of the tonsils is to provide protection against bacteria and other harmful material. They form a ring around the border between the oral cavity and the throat or the pharynx. The pharyngeal uh, tonsils can also be called adenoids. That is only when they become enlarged. Um, and what happens when that occurs, uh, if there is some type of uh, infection enlarging them, uh, is they can interfere with your breathing. And that is why the uh, pharyngeal, as well as the palatine, are going to be commonly removed, uh, although the lingual one can be removed, uh, it's not as likely. What's kind of interesting about tonsils is that in adults, they decrease in size and may eventually disappear um, as you get older. So kind of cool stuff. Moving on to lymph nodes. Um, lymph nodes are the only lymphatic structure to filter lymph. So make sure you make a little know that. Lymph nodes are the only lymphatic structure to filter lymph. Uh, they are small, round, bean-shaped structures, uh, 1 to 25 millimeters long, and they are responsible for, again, filtering lymph. And the purpose of this is to remove bacteria and other materials from that fluid lymph before putting it back into uh, your blood circulation, right? There are two categories of lymph nodes, and that is superficial lymph and deep lymph nodes. So the superficial ones are going to be, um, you know, more near the skin. The deep lymph nodes are, of course, going to be deeper. They are also organized into cortex and medulla with dense connective tissue capsules surrounding them. They do have trabeculae that extend within. Reticular fibers are going to form a supporting network. So that trabeculae is just going to be an extension of the surrounding capsule as well. So make a little note of that. We do have afferent and efferent lymphatic vessels. As the names imply, it is just talking about uh, where they are carrying to or from uh, lymph. The afferent lymph nodes are going to carry lymph to the lymph nodes where they will be filtered. The efferent lymph nodes or lymphatic vessels are going to carry lymph away from the lymph nodes. You have roughly 450 lymph nodes throughout your entire body, uh, which is kind of a, a cool thing to know, I think. These substances are going to be removed from lymph by phagocytosis, so that's going to be um, a form of endocytosis. Uh, so cells are going to essentially engulf whatever it is that shouldn't be there. Or we are going to stimulate the lymphocytes to proliferate, proliferate in the germinal centers of the lymph nodes. So whichever way is going to get rid of whatever it is that is uh, acting as an infection, um, we are either going to rapidly um, divide the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes or uh, 
some form of phagocytosis is going to occur to get the, get whatever it is that we need to get out. And then cancer cells often migrate to lymph nodes, very unfortunately, and are trapped there. What will happen if cancer cells are trapped in the lymph nodes is they will proliferate as well, just like lymphocytes, uh, meaning they will increase in number, um, reproduce, if you will, and can move from the lymphatic system to the circulatory system and then spread cancer throughout the body. So that is a very not good thing to occur um, should that happen. Uh, it's, it's not good at all. So here we can see a nice little um, illustration of a lymph node. I think they always look kind of like grapefruits with like worms coming off of them. <laughs> but that is going to be the capsule that you see in green surrounding the outside. And then of course we do have that little bit of histology there um, showing our little lymphatic tissue um, with the cortex and the medulla and the capsule. So. All right, so here we have the start of discussing the spleen. Um, the spleen is one of the more distinct, uh, I think, organs of the lymphatic system. The rest of them are kind of like um, vessels and things that you would think kind of like a gland. Uh, while the spleen is more of a, a hardcore, you can see it, you can hold it, you can touch it um, type organ. The spleen is going to be larger in males than it is in females, and it will decrease in size as you get older. It is going to be located in the left superior side of the abdomen. We've seen it a few times in lab already. Uh, it's going to be that kind of weird, normally colored purple um, organ that you're going to see kind of close to the stomach. It can be ruptured in traumatic abdominal injuries that, is, that can result in bleeding. Uh, what this may have to uh, happen in order to avoid uh, shock and death is a splenectomy. Um, that is where you just remove the spleen if it has been damaged um, beyond repair, essentially. Uh, if that should happen, you can live without a spleen. Um, your other lymphatic vessels will compensate for the loss and basically perform the functions of the spleen themselves. The spleen is going to be made up of white pulp, which is lymphatic tissue, that is going to be more associated with arteries, while the other pulp is red pulp, uh, and that is going to be associated with macrophages and red blood cells, uh, is going to be more closely um, associated with veins. And that is the big difference between white and red pulp. You are going to have something called periarterial peri lymphatic sheath and lymphatic nodules are going to contain lymphocytes and macrophages, uh, as well as diffuse lymphatic tissue. You are going to have splenic cords, which are going to be reticular cells that are producing reticular fibers and blood is going to flow through the spleen at three different rates. So for the most part, it will be fast, then we have slow and intermediate. Slow flow is via open circulation and no direct capillary connection between arteries and veins, uh, and the blood where, will uh, percolate through the splenic cords. And then getting to the more important thing that I want you to know is going to be the three functions of the spleen. The first is to destroy defective red blood cells. Um, so red blood cells, as they get older, lose the ability to bend and fold through capillaries. Um, and due to this factor, as they pass through the splenic cord meshwork, uh, they're going to rupture. And that is how the spleen kind of uh, gets rid of uh, defective red blood cells. The second function is going to detect and respond to foreign substances. The third is going to uh, be a limited reservoir for blood. Not too much, but I mean, it's still something, right? And then of course we do have um, this lovely illustration of where to find the spleen. Uh, as well as the parts of the spleen. We've got our splenic artery and splenic vein uh, going into the hilum of the spleen. 
And then on the far right, we are looking at white versus red pulp in this illustration. And remember, the white pulp is going to be more associated with arteries, while the red pulp is going to be associated with veins. So everywhere you see red, that is the white pulp. Everywhere where you see blue, that is the red pulp. I know that's kind of confusing, but just <laughs> you just look at the illustration and see how it's uh, labeled out. This slide is going to show you the uh, blood flow through white and red pulp. I don't think I ask you to know anything very specific about this. Um, it's kind of more interesting than anything, but if you'd like to read through this, now is a good time to stop and take a peek. And then last but not least, we do have this lovely histology slide um, showing our white pulp that's kind of that more dark purple. Um, I like to think of them as islands, if you will, these little islands of uh, lymphatic tissue surrounded by red pulp. So the white pulp is going to be um, less than the red pulp when it comes to the spleen. The next organ in the lymphatic system is going to be the thymus. The thymus is probably um, something you have loosely heard of before. Uh, and honestly, it's one of those very, very weird structures that we have that <laughs> honestly, if you didn't know where it was, what it was, you probably never know about it in your life, unless it was acting up, of course. Uh, so the thymus is going to be a bilobed gland in the superior mediastinum. Remember, the mediastinum is going to be that cavity where your heart sits between the pleural cavities, so where your lungs are. So the mediastinum is right in the middle where your heart goes. In fact, on the next slide, we're going to look at the location of the thymus, and it sits just superior to the heart. It almost covers the aorta, so you'll see here in just a moment. It is going to increase in size the first year of life, so as you're developing, and remain the same size until you're about 60. And then it will start to decrease in size uh, as, its, as its functions start to diminish. The lobes surround, uh, the lobes of the thymus, I'm sorry, are going to be surrounded by a capsule. Uh, and it is going to have trabeculae that are going to extend into the gland and divide it into lobules. You're going to notice a lot of these structures that when we talk about uh, uh, glands and various things like that, they are going to have uh, little lobules in them. The internal framework is going to be made up of epithelial cells. Uh, it is going to have other lymphatic, uh, going to be different than other lymphatic tissue in that um, other lymphatic tissue is typically going to be a fibrous network of reticular fibers and the thymus still having lymphatic tissue is made up of epithelial cells as opposed to a fibrous network of reticular fibers so kind of interesting <clears throat> excuse me the cortex of the thymus is going to have many lymphocytes the medulla is going to have uh, fewer lymphocytes but has a thymic corpuscle um, for more than 150 years uh, the function of the thymic corpuscle was pretty much unknown uh, but now we know that it is involved in development of regulatory T cells uh, so remember a type of lymphocyte um, and this is going to suppress the body's immune response and protect it against autoimmune diseases so anything that has to do with an autoimmune disease it's pretty much just your body attacking itself um, and thinking that it needs to protect you from you um, and we'll talk about those more here in just a bit the thymus is also going to be the site of maturation of T cells the thymus is going to secrete a hormone called thymosin uh, which is important in T cell development so here is the location of the thymus. Again, it kind of sits right on top of the heart. Um, if you didn't know any better, you'd probably look at this and think that the thymus was actually fat. Um, but it is this lovely little gland uh, that sits just on top of the heart. It has nothing to do with heart function. Um, that's just where it is. And it does have those little lymph nodes um, associated with it as well. 
And then of course we do have uh, these lobules um, within the thymus. You can see them pretty distinctly here on this histology slide. You can see the cortex being the outside, the medulla being that lighter inside, and then the trabeculae are going to be separating the, uh, the lobules. This slide is a lot, <laughs> so I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to pause it and take a peek. Um, but this, I'm just going to kind of in general say what's going on here. Uh, but this is, is just an overview of the lymphatic system and how things kind of move through the lymphatic system themselves, uh, the various vessels, the various uh, organs associated with it, as well as arterial and venous circulation and how that um, kind of factors in. Uh, but just know that this is going to help regulate fluid uh, levels in your various tissues and provide protection against pathogens. That is the overall arching thing I want you to get from this slide, even though it is pretty much a novel. Moving on to immunity. Immunity is going to be your ability to resist damage from foreign substances such as microorganisms and harmful chemicals. You have two types of immunity or uh, two categories would probably a good, be a good way to uh, um, describe that a little bit better. The first is going to be innate or nonspecific. This is going to be where the body recognizes and destroys foreign substances but the response is always the same. It doesn't matter if it's the first time, the second time, the ninth time, the hundredth time. It is going to still act exactly the same. Uh, it is nonspecific resistance, and it's called that for a, resist for a reason. Um, there are a few examples, and we're going to go over uh, each one of these individually. So just make a little note. We are going to talk about innate or nonspecific resistance uh, first. The second immunity uh, category is going to be adaptive or specific immunity. The one very important thing about adaptive immunity is that it's kind of like innate in that it's the body recognizing and destroying foreign substances, but the response after the first time is going to be faster and stronger. Now, just because these are two different categories doesn't mean they don't work together, which they do pretty frequently. Uh, and we'll talk about when that happens. Again, we're going to talk about these various uh, aspects, um, but with adaptive and specific immunity, uh, there are two characteristics and that is specificity. So the ability to recognize a particular substance and then memory which is going to be the ability to remember previous encounters with a particular substance and respond rapidly. And that is how adaptive immunity is going to be able to uh, respond faster and stronger than innate uh, immunity when it comes to um, an invasion or an infection after the first time. As I said, we are going to talk about innate immunity and its various characteristics first. Um, so the first is going to be physical barriers. These are going to be uh, preventative measures that are going to keep microbes and chemicals from entering your body. A few examples, your skin and mucous membranes, your tears, saliva, and urine which is going to kind of act as a way to wash out uh, various areas um, so that pathogens essentially can't take hold. Your cilia in your respiratory tract, and I know we've talked about this, remember that we have those cilia that are going to act um, in time with goblet cells, which produce mucus, and that is going to trap any debris or anything like that, and then push and move it out uh, of the respiratory tract, and either you're going to just consume it, um, or you're going to cough it up or sneeze it out. Uh, and that is also a physical barrier with innate immunity. 
Moving on into chemical mediators, uh, some chemical mediators are going to be on the surface of cells and kill microorganisms uh, or prevent them from entering the cells. An example is lysozyme in your tears. This is going to have the ability, uh, an enzyme that's going to have the ability to destroy microorganisms before they can even find their way into your eye, essentially. But chemical mediators are going to be molecules responsible for aspects of your innate immunity. And we do have a few examples of those. And we are going to talk about a few of these individually. Um, so you have histamine and kinines, which are going to cause vasodilation and increase vascular permeability during inflammation. When it comes to inflammation, you can make a little note here. Inflammation is just going to be anything that is going to cause more blood flow to an area, uh, which is going to then increase the ability for more immune system cells um, to come in and help with whatever needs being removed. So inflammation just means more blood flow to an area. You have interferons, which are going to help with your viral defense. We are going to talk more about interferons here in a minute. Complement, which again we're going to talk more on, uh, is going to promote inflammation and destroy microbes. And then prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which are going to promote inflammation. We will talk more about inflammation here in a minute. And last but not least, we have pyrogens, which are going to be proteins that are going to promote a fever, and we'll talk about how that happens too. So starting with complement, again, this is a type of chemical mediator within innate immunity. Complement is going to be uh, made up of a group of 20 or more proteins that circulate in the blood in an inactive form. So they're kind of just roaming around waiting to be activated. Once they become activated, it's going to take something called a complement cascade to activate them. Uh, you are going to have two types of pathways the classical or alternative pathways. <clears throat> um, and that is going to be, with the alternative pathway, a part of innate immunity where C3, which is just a protein, is going to bind with foreign substances and attract macrophages, so another type of white blood cell if you remember. The classical pathway is going to be part of adaptive immunity and requires antibodies um, bound to antigens to, to activate the uh, complement. So this is one way that adaptive and innate immunity are going to be integrated together. So again, they are kind of their own separate thing, but they still work together. More on complements. Um, these are going to be uh, activated complement proteins. Uh, can do three things. One, form membrane attack complexes, or MAC, and make a channel through the plasma membrane of microbes resulting in cell lysis. So this is just going to be essentially where the cell kind of uh, becomes destroyed in a way. Opsonization, where the complement proteins attach to the surface of bacterial cells and thus stimulate phagocytosis of that cell, so that cell will cell, not soul, cell will become engulfed. Uh, and then third is to attract immune system cells to the site of infection and promote inflammation. So again, to increase blood flow to that area. Now, as lovely as this graphic is and how very nicely um, <laughs> the explanation of a complement cascade is you do not need to know all this C1 to C9 and, and every little bit here in the complement cascade. Please just kind of uh, take a peek and listen to what I'm saying here. And that is complement proteins are going to circulate in blood in an inactive form. So on a daily basis, your complement proteins are not going to be doing anything. They are only going to become activated if they need to, and that is through this complement cascade. In this illustration, only the activated proteins are going to be shown. So um, we don't really care unless they're activated, especially when it comes to just this type of illustration. Um, the complement cascade will begin with either the alternative pathway or the classical. And it does show you 
um, at the very top, the classical pathway, and then where you see the number three in purple, uh, that is going to be where the alternative pathway begins. Moving on to interferons. Again, we are still talking about innate immunity. Um, I'll let you know when we start talking about the other type. So interferons are going to be proteins that protect against viruses and some forms of cancer. They are going to prevent specifically viral replication. So the way viruses work, just to give you a little uh, background memory on uh, viruses, is that viruses need a host cell in order to replicate. In doing so, they are going to kill the host cell. As that dying cell uh, kind of, <laughs> for lack of a better term, realizes its own mortality, it is going to release interferons. Um, so these proteins that are going to warn the neighboring cells that, hey, I'm being invaded and I'm dying, um, but so you guys don't die, you know, here's, here's a warning, if you will. So interferons are going to be produced by infected cells, but they're going to cause the neighboring cells to produce antiviral proteins. So they are going to start protecting themselves from the virus that their neighbor um, unfortunately contracted. Moving on to certain cells. Um, again, this is still within our innate immunity, but these are types of cells that are going to um, be, be a part of that uh, immunity there. We have talked about white blood cells before, but we are going to go a little bit um, further in uh, with them. So white blood cells are going to be produced in red bone marrow and in lymphatic tissue. Uh, they are the most important cellular components of the immune system and they need to have the ability to move into infected tissue and destroy infections. So they are able to move throughout your interstitial tissue, some of them, uh, as well as they're going to be transported to various areas through the lymphatic system, as well as mainly your cardiovascular system. And how they do that, how they know where to go, uh, they aren't given little um, beepers that tell them, oh, meet me here in the, you know, left arm or something like that. They use something called chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is going to be the movement toward the source of some chemotaxic uh, factors. So these are going to be parts of microbes or chemicals that act as a chemical signal that's going to actually act as a, like a homing beacon to attract white blood cells. And then they are going to use something called phagocytosis. This is going to be something uh, like endocytosis um, that is going to engulf whatever it is that is the offending uh, microbe and then destroy um, uh, these cells. Um, and these cells that are able to use phagocytosis are going to be called phagocytes. The two types of phagocytes within white blood cells are going to be neutrophils and macrophages. These are the two most important phagocytic cells. Um, neutrophils are going to be uh, <laughs> obviously using phagocytosis and are the first cells to enter infected tissue. You have a lot more neutrophils than you do any other type of white blood cell. So it makes sense that they're going to be the first ones at the, uh, at the scene, if you will. They are going to be the first cells to enter the infected tissue and can also release lysosomal enzymes that are going to kill microorganisms and cause tissue damage and inflammation all at the same time. Essentially, they're the first responders and they are going to make kind of a, a large war scene, if you will, to stop whatever the infection is. Uh, potentially, these poor little cells are only going to last a few hours, um, but regularly will cross the wall of the gastrointestinal tract and provide protection in the digestive tract as well. One of the things that neutrophils can cause is something called pus. Pus is probably something you're familiar with in some capacity. 
it's that ooey gooey whitish yellowish not smelling good uh fluid that's sometimes a little bit on the chunky side uh, but it's usually thick um, in consistency but that is the accumulation of dead neutrophils dead microorganisms debris from your dead tissues as well as fluid so pus is just sort of a uh, an after effect or a byproduct of your neutrophils fighting so hard for your body to fight off an infection so kind of a new appreciation for pus and neutrophils i think <laughs> So moving on to macrophages, they are a large phagocytic cell, and these are usually going to accumulate in your tissues after the neutrophils um, are going to be there. Uh, they are also responsible, your macrophages of course, are going to re be responsible for phagocytic activity in the late stages of infection. This includes cleanup duty. So all of the damage and all of the uh, good things that the neutrophils did, um, the macrophages are going to come in and essentially clean up the mess, as well as all of the fallen white blood cells uh, in battle. Macrophages are going to be um, what monocytes mature into. Uh, this does talk about monocytes a little bit, um, but it's not the most important thing here. Macrophages are also going to produce interferons, prostaglandins, uh, and complement to enhance immune responses as well in areas of infection. Moving on to more white blood cells, we have basophils and mast cells. Um, Specifically, basophils um, are going to um, release histamines and leukotrienes, uh, which are just going to produce an inflammatory response. These can be activated by innate or adaptive, uh, the adaptive system. Basophils are going to be motile and leave the blood and enter infected tissues. And then mast cells are going to be kind of the opposite. They're non-modal and they are going to exist in uh, connective tissue near capillaries. Acenophils, which I think are my favorite, uh, are going to leave the blood and enter surrounding tissues. Their numbers are going to go up in the case of allergies or allergic reactions, um, and they're going to cause a lot of inflammation. Um, but they reduce inflammation by breaking down chemicals produced by uh, basophils and mast cells specifically. They are going to secrete an enzyme that kills some parasites. So in the case of pretty much any time you have a parasite, <laughs> acenophils are going to be the number one white blood cell to help fight whatever parasite it is. And then last but not least, we do have the natural killer cell, um, one of the cooler named ones. Uh, this is a type of lymphocyte. So just like our B cells and T cells, NK cells are also a type of lymphocyte. These can lyse tumors and virus infected cells. Uh, NK cells make up about 15% of your lymphocytes uh, and they are part of your innate immunity. They are going to recognize whole classes of cells, not specific kinds of cells. And they're going to use a variety of methods to kill target cells, but the only one I really want you to kind of like know because it's cool uh, is releasing chemicals that damage the plasma membrane and will cause the cell to lyse itself. Moving on to inflammatory responses. So again, this is the tissue being injured regardless of type. Uh, it'll cause inflammation because blood is going to flow to that area to try to uh, heal that area as quickly as it can um, or get rid of whatever that infection may be. The type of injury that we're talking about here can include trauma, burns, chemicals, or infections. Um, it is a response initiated by chemical mediators that produce vasodilation, 
chemotactic attraction, increased vascular permeability, and then the latter allows fibrinogen and complement to enter the tissue. The fibrinogen is going to be converted to fibrin and it walls off the infected area so we can't infect other areas, of course. There is an example of an inflammatory uh, response, a very nice uh, diagram, in fact, here in two slides. We'll get to that. There are uh, two types of inflammatory responses, um, local and systemic. So local, if you can't kind of gather from the names, uh, local inflammation is going to be confined to a specific area. And that is the main thing. Uh, the symptoms are going to include redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function in that specific area. Systemic inflammation is going to occur in many parts of the body at the same time. Uh, and they're all going to have the same symptoms as local, but in addition to an increase in neutrophil numbers released by red bone marrow. <clears throat> A fever due to the production of pyrogens, which we've talked about before, by various kinds of cells. Uh, these can be good and bad cells. They can be cells of your own body. Uh, pyrogens can also be produced by cells um, like a virus as well. Um, so that's, that's not exactly a good thing. But this is going to improve the performance of the immune system if it's something that we want. Um, obviously, if a virus causes you to have a fever, it's a little bit harder to bring it down. But once your fever breaks, you're doing great. In other cases, um, still with viruses, it just sort of depends on what it is. Uh, sometimes your body produces the fever itself. Um, it's going to essentially what these pyrogens do. It's going to affect your body temperature regulating mechanisms in your hypothalamus, so up in your brain. And it's going to cause heat production and heat conservation. So not only are you going to be producing heat, you're going to keep the heat in your body as well, which is just going to increase your body temperature. So sometimes that helps fight things off. That's a good thing. The third thing that systemic inflammation, uh, one of the symptoms can be, is in severe cases, get widespread increased vascular permeability due to histamines being released. Large volumes of plasma enter the interstitial spaces, leading to shock and potentially death. Not good. So as I said before, this is a nice uh, illustration showing um, an inflammatory response. I love things like this. I love when things get nice and organized in this way. Um, but this is an example of an inflammatory response um, where we have bacteria uh, causing tissue damage and the release of chemical mediators are going to initiate inflammation and phagocytosis uh, to where hopefully we result in the destruction of the bacteria. And if the bacteria remains, uh, then we're just gonna go back up and release more chemical mediators as needed and start that process over until we can get the bacteria out of there. We want the bacteria gone so we can start to repair the tissue. It's gotta be gone before we can repair. Okay, everything we have talked about thus far uh, has been about innate immunity or nonspecific resistance. Now we are going to start talking about adaptive immunity and its various uh, characteristics, um, also known as specific resistance. Um, so this is going to involve the ability to recognize, respond to, and remember a particular substance. So again, adaptive immunity is going to have the unique characteristic of being able to respond faster and better or stronger uh, to an infection than the innate immunity is going to. Um, so we do have these large molecules called antigens. These are going to stimulate our adaptive immunity. Um, there are two types that I want you to know, foreign and self antigens. Foreign antigens are not produced by your body. Uh, they are introduced from the outside. Examples are going to include bacteria, viruses, other microorganisms that cause disease um, as well excuse me, as pollen, 
animal dander, dander uh, feces of mites, foods, drugs, um, can cause uh, an overreaction of the immune system called allergic reactions as well. Um, so these are all essentially things that can cause uh, those allergic reactions, right? Self antigens are going to produced, be produced by your own body and used as markers to allow adaptive immune response uh, to differentiate self from non-self. I like to think of self antigens as being like IDs. Um, so whether that's like a school ID or a license or anything like that, it's something that is saying, I'm meant to be here. I'm, I'm okay. I'm good. Uh, you don't have to kick me out. Meanwhile, the foreign antigens are going to act as the wrong ID or a fake ID. Um, immediately, uh, your antibodies are going to know you're not supposed to be here and you need to leave. So, a response to self antigens resulting in tissue destruction, usually it's going to be helpful and you're not going to have to worry about it, but when it causes a problem, this is what we call autoimmune diseases. An example of this would be like rheumatoid arthritis, which is going to destroy the tissues within your joints. Um, it's basically your body misidentifying and saying that is not uh, self antigens. We need to destroy those. But in the end, it just causes a lot of harm uh, to you. Um, and it's not a good thing. All right, so here we're going to start talking about our B cells and T cells a little bit more. Uh, so these, again, are just our two major types of lymphocytes. They are both going to act as a defense uh, system for your body, but they are going to carry out that defense in two different ways. So the first is the antibody mediated. Um, this is going to involve antibodies that act as a way like a, like a security system. Um, but we have B cells. B cells are going to make cells that make antibodies. Um, very important uh, function there for B cells. Again, B cells are going to make cells that are going to produce antibodies uh, into your system. And then the next type is going to be cell mediated or our T cells, another type of lymphocyte, remember. Um, so they are going to... Uh, T cells are going to have different kinds, such as cytotoxic T cells. Their function is to destroy infected cells. And then helper T cells and regulatory T cells are both going to promote or inhibit uh, both antibody mediated and cell mediated immunity. And if you need help remembering all of the various cells that you need to know, um, check out table 22.3. Um, for a breakdown of those cells of the adaptive immunity um, system and their functions. Um, if you have the textbook, it's on page 798. So here we are going to be uh, talking about the origin and development of lymphocytes. Uh, so still moving with that adaptive immunity, uh, just talking about the cells a little bit more specifically. So these are going to be cells that are derived from stem cells in red bone marrow. Uh, Pre-T cells are going to go to the thymus to mature, and the pre-B cells are just going to stay in the bone marrow to mature. So we do have two different things we need to talk about here, the positive selection and negative selection. Positive positive selection is going to ensure the survival of lymphocytes that react against antigens. Uh, these are then going to proliferate and form something called clones. Uh, clones are just going to be identical lymphocytes. If the cells cannot perform an immune response, they will end up dying. Uh, but we do want to essentially proliferate and form more of those types of cells. In the negative selection, this is going to eliminate clones of lymphocytes that react against self antigens, uh, thereby preventing the destruction of one's own cells. And then we do have a term here, tolerance. We will talk about tolerance here in just a little bit, so don't worry about it on this slide for now. But there are many, many different kinds of clones uh, that exist because of genetic recombination during development. 
The purpose of this is to make it where your immune system can react to most molecules. If you have a cell in your body that knows how to handle um, some type of something, it, it, it's like a little, uh, a little PhD, a little person who's a doctor, if you will, that has a PhD or a speciality in something. As long as you have at least, you know, maybe one or a few of those roaming around in your body at any given point in time, you have someone who knows how to handle those situations. Um, so very important. This slide is going to talk about um, more of that origin and development of lymphocytes. Um, so how B and T cells are going to uh, originate in bone marrow, as I said. But we do have two ways that they kind of, uh, where they move to, if you will. They're going to move to primary lymphatic organs where they mature into functional cells. B cells move to bone marrow and T cells move to the thymus, as I've already stated. The secondary lymphatic organs and tissues are going to include lymphocytes uh, interacting with each other, antigen presenting cells and antigens to produce the immune response uh, where they diffuse, uh, go into diffuse lymphatic tissue, lymphatic nodules, tonsils, lymph nodes, and the spleen. So now that we've talked about lymphocytes origins, we need to talk about how to activate a lymphocyte. So antigens are going to activate lymphocytes in different ways, uh, dependent on the type of lymphocyte and the type of antigen. Um, there are different ways to activate a lymphocyte. The first is being able to recognize the antigen. The second is after uh, recognition, the lymphocytes must increase in number to effectively destroy an antigen. If there's not enough numbers, it's not going to matter. Um, if they're, you know, well trained, they need to have the numbers in order to uh, combat some type of uh, infection or antigen. So here we're gonna talk about antigenic determinants. Uh, lymphocytes must be able to interact and recognize an antigen. Uh, antigens are gonna be really large, so we need these antigenic determinants, which are going to be specific regions of a given antigen uh, that is going to be recognized by a lymphocyte. So as you can see on this illustration, we have different antigenic uh, determinants on the surface of this antigen uh, so that the uh, lymphocytes only need to focus on that one antigenic determinant. They don't need to focus on the whole thing. Uh, otherwise, that would just be, they just wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> so on our lymphocytes, we're going to have these antigen receptors. These are going to combine with a specific antigenic determinant uh, of a given antigen. So kind of like that last illustration that we saw where it had different antigenic determinants, um, we're going to have something kind of like a lock and key mechanism. Um, a lymphocyte is going to have a specific antigen receptor uh, that is going to bind to a determinant. Um, so again, like a lock and key, it just needs to find its right uh, key or lock, whichever side you want to think of. It needs to find its matching puzzle piece, if you will. Um, so T cell receptors and B cell receptors are going to be slightly different in composition. Uh, one is going to have two polypeptide chains, while the other one is going to have four. There is another way other than um, uh, direct interaction. Um, with an antigen uh, is not going to work, essentially. Also, this is going to be how most lymphocytes uh, are going to be activated, and that is through major histocompatibility complex molecules. Try saying that five times fast, I dare you. Uh, so MHC molecules are going to be glycoproteins found on the plasma membrane of most cells. Now, what these guys are going to do is one of two things depending on their class. Um, 
So the first class is going to be where you have these molecules found on the surface of nucleated cells. Keep in mind that these are going to be cells that are going to be making up the vast majority of your body um, in concert with antigens that were produced inside the cell from, uh, for example, uh, a digested virus particles. Um, so this is the example that we have here. Um, so let's say we have a virus. What viruses do is they're going to proliferate inside of a healthy cell in your body, right? This is going to cause these MHC molecules to kind of throw up a red flag that is essentially saying, kill me, um, to other cells in your immune system, uh, and thus destroy that infected cell. The MHC class two uh, molecules are going to be found on the surface of antigen presenting cells, so not normal cells. These are going to include B cells, macrophages, monocytes, and dendritic cells, which side note, dendritic cells are just large modal uh, cells with long cytoplasmic extensions, but regardless, uh, they are going to display um, an antigen on the surface of the cell, just like the class one molecules, but they are not saying kill me. Um, so the way I think of both of these is that the purpose of both MHC molecule types, class one and class two, is to display antigens on the surface of the cell after combining with a fragment of whatever the offending cell is, a virus, a bacteria, um, some type of microorganism that shouldn't be there. So after this cell combines and kind of rips apart or gets a piece um, of the antigen that shouldn't be there, they're going to display it on the surface of the cell. For MHC class one molecules, um, what they're going to do is kind of like suicide by immune system cells. Um, so they're, they're going to say, I'm infected, but here it is, I have the proof, kill me, kill me now before the infection gets worse. MHC class two molecules are going to throw up the antigen uh, and present it to other cells that can do something about it. Um, but more like a wanted poster, not kill me, uh, just like handing out um, papers saying, this is the person I'm looking for. Uh, all of you should be looking for them too, kind of thing and destroy them. Hope that analogy makes sense. <laughs> so this is going to be the process um, for antigen uh, processing for MHC uh, class one. And then this is the antigen processing for MHC class two. So you can see it presenting there on the outside after uh, kind of ripping things apart. Moving on to something called co-stimulation. Uh, so we did talk about our B cells and our T cells, uh, but we need to talk about how they are able to produce a response. Uh, and that is going to lead us to co-stimulation. So the following is going to be how we arrange a response from these specific lymphocytes. So we're going to have the binding of the MHC class two uh, or antigen complex to the T cell receptor, as well as co-stimulation. This is going to be accomplished by uh, cytokines, which are proteins or peptides that are secreted by a cell that regulate the activity of neighboring cells. Um, and they are going to be released, these cytokines are going to be released from cells, as well as molecules attached to the surface of the cell. The second thing that's going to accomplish our co-stimulation is by surface molecules, uh, specifically binding 
of two molecules, B7 and CD28, uh, on the macrophage and helper T cells. These are going to help to hold the cells together. This is a nice illustration uh, showing co-stimulation occurring. So we have the activation of lymphocytes requiring multiple signals. Uh, so the binding of MHC molecules and antigen complex and co-stimulatory uh, signals at the same time. In this example, multiple signals are involved in the activation of a helper T cell as it interacts with an antigen presenting cell, as in the case of a macrophage. And you can see all of that going on there. And then of course you can pause it if you'd like to and kind of read through. Um, but I think if you understood what I just said, you'd probably be good. All right, so lymphocyte proliferation. So if we have our cells from the original clones, um, we need to have them proliferate before an antigen can be attacked effectively. Again, I've said this before, uh, if the numbers are too small, they're not going to be effective. So we need to up our soldiers, if you will. So the first thing we need to do is to uh, have the proliferation of helper T cells occur first, then our APCs or antigen producing cells uh, present the antigen with MHC class 2 molecules, and then the T cells with appropriate receptors are going to respond to that. The second thing to happen is our helper T cells are going to aid in the proliferation and activation of our B cells or cytotoxic T cells. Our B cells activation is going to result in plasma cells and memory B cells. And we'll talk about those here in just a moment. They're both very, very important. So make a little note, um, our B cells are going to result in producing plasma cells and memory B cells. We are gonna talk about them. So the next two slides are going to be this process of proliferating uh, helper T cells. So our antigen presenting cells uh, are going to be macrophages uh, that are going to stimulate the helper T cells to divide and produce uh, cytokines. And if you'd like to read through these next two slides, you can definitely take a pause and read through them. And then we have the proliferation of B cells. So a helper T cell is going to stimulate a B cell to divide. And most uh, daughter cells, and there are only two showing here, sometimes there's more, uh, differentiate to become plasma cells that produce antibodies. Remember I said those plasma cells are gonna be very, very important. Uh, they produce the antibodies. So remember, if you go back a few slides, I said B cells are going to be uh, the cells that are going to make the cells that produce antibodies. In this case, plasma cells are the cells that are made by B cells and will produce uh, antibodies. And a few of these plasma cells are going to reduce in size and become what's known as memory B cells. The memory B cells, and I believe we are gonna talk about this more, uh, are going to be the cells that are going to, uh, as the name imply, uh, implies, remember how to react to um, what's going on, if you will. So they are going to remember, uh, and I always say they're kind of like little cells with scrapbooks or yearbooks. Hey, remember that one time that we fought off this one infection? Well, here's how we did it and how we can do it again. They're the cells with a plan, if you will. So again, if you want to pause, you may, but I am just going to skip through this as I feel like I have explained it uh, plenty. All right, moving on to the inhibition of lymphocytes. Um, so we are going to talk about this term that I did just gloss over and kind of say that we were gonna talk about it later. It is tolerance. Tolerance is a state of unresponsiveness of lymphocytes to a specific antigen. And the most common is unresponsiveness to self antigens. So kind of in summary of that, 
the important function of tolerance is to prevent the immune system from responding to self antigens, although foreign antigens very unfortunately uh, can also induce tolerance as well. Um, and tolerance is a big way to avoid autoimmune diseases. But again, it doesn't always work. Uh, so how we provoke tolerance is going to be these three ways here. Uh, the deletion of self reactive lymphocytes, the prevention preventing action, activation of lymphocytes that encounter self antigens, which is also known as energy. And the third is the activation of regulatory T cells, which can also be called suppressor cells, uh, cells that may produce suppressive cytokines or kill antigen presenting cells. So that is all how we inhibit uh, our lymphocytes and inhibit their functions. Okay, so here we are going to talk a little bit more about antibody um, mediated immunity. So these are going to be, uh, or this is going to be effective against extracellular antigens, um, including bacteria, viruses, protozoans, fungi, parasites, and toxins, as long as they are outside of the cell. So if they're inside of the cell, this is going to do diddly and squat. So our antibodies uh, are going to be proteins produced in response to an antigen. They are going to be found in your plasma. We are also going to have something called immunoglobulins. Uh, so these are going to be globulins involved in, surprisingly, immunity. <laughs> and we are going to have five classes of these immunoglobulins. So I'm not going to read them out, but they are just G, M, A, E, and D um, at the end of I, G. So these five classes are all going to be very similar in their structure. Uh, they all have a similar Y shape, and you'll see um, potentially on the next slide uh, or two how that looks. Um, so they are going to have something called the variable region. This is the part that combines with antigenic determinant uh, uh, of an antigen. And then you have the constant region. This is going to be responsible for activities of the antibodies, like activating complete complement uh, or attaching to various kinds of white blood cells. So again, on the right side, um, you have that variable region. You see how it kind of looks like a Y uh, here. Uh, so on the right side there, we see that variable region. And then we have the constant region uh, kind of forming that, that base of the Y. And that's, this is showing uh, our antibody here and our antigen binding sites uh, up at the top. So again, we're going to have kind of a lock and key um, mechanism going on, uh, making sure it can only bind to a specific part, right? A specific uh, key or specific lock, however you want to picture it, on the antigen, of the antigens. <laughs> Okay, so what I want you to know about the effects of antibodies is that antibodies can directly affect antigens in one of two ways. Uh, one, the antibody can bind to the antigenic determinant and interfere with the antigen's uh, ability to function. Or the second way uh, is that the antibody can combine with an antigenic determinant on two different antigens. Um, thus rendering the antigens ineffective. The ability of uh, antibodies to join antigens together is the basis for many clinical tests and one that we're pretty familiar with, which is a blood typing test. Uh, so because when enough antigens are bound together, they become visible as a clump or a precipitate. So remember watching um, those blood typing tests going on, uh, you can see that coagulation happening because there is a reaction occurring. This is that same kind of concept here uh, that this is discussing here in this, uh, this figure, this illustration. And same goes for this next slide here. It is still just kind of um, 
showing the effect of antibodies and kind of continuing on with uh, this description here. Moving on to antibody production, so how we are going to be um, producing our antibodies. So we do have a primary response, um, which is going to be that first or initial response, that initial kind of outbreak, if you will. It is going to occur when a B cell is first activated by an antigen, and B cells are going to proliferate to produce plasma cells. Um, so this is antibody production and memory cells. Remember we talked about our uh, plasma cells and our little memory cells with their little scrapbooks, um, remembering that time that we uh, encountered whatever this antigen is attached to. The secondary response is going to occur during um, a later exposure to the same antigen. So whatever this may be, if you were um, introduced to a virus or something, um, and then you got reintroduced to it, your secondary response is going to be much quicker, it's going to be stronger, your memory cells are going to divide rapidly to form plasma cells, and thus they are going to produce antibodies that are going to help fight off uh, that infection, whatever it may be for the second time or third time or however many times. But do make a note, this is going to be a faster and greater response than the primary response. And again, this is what defines uh, our adaptive immunity. So this illustration is just showing exactly what we were talking about with that primary response versus the secondary response. Uh, it has these lovely little graphs here at the bottom on the right um, that is showing that, but because I feel like we explained it pretty well on the last slide, uh, you don't have to know this all verbatim, just know what we talked about on the last slide. And this is a nice little way to uh, visually display that as well. All right, so cell-mediated immunity. Uh, cell-mediated immunity is going to be most effective against intracellular microbes through the action of cytotoxic T cells. Um, and also from MHC molecules, they can identify abnormal or infected cells. And this is going to involve uh, delayed hypersensitivity reactions as well. So our cytotoxic T cell functions in two ways. The first is going to be to lyse our virus infected cells, tumor cells, and tissue transplants. Uh, our major lysin is perforin. So that's just talking about what that primary enzyme is going to be, is perforin, which is going to form a hole in the plasma, or it's going to, um, what's the word, perforate? <laughs> um, a hole in the plasma membrane of the target cell. And then the second way is to produce cytokines, which are going to promote phagocytosis and inflammation. And as an antibody mediated immunity, our memory cells are going to be produced once again. Our cytotoxic T cells are going to increase in number in response to an abnormal MHC class one molecule. And that's all this is essentially just showing you. Um, so you can kind of just take that as you want. Here we are seeing the stimulation and effects of T cells. Moving on to acquired adaptive immunity. Uh, so innate immunity uh, is going to be present at birth, but adaptive immunity must be acquired. Uh, so you have a few different ways to acquire uh, your adaptive immunity. Um, the first is immunization. This is the deliberate exposure to uh, the antigen or antibody. You have active natural immunity, which is going to be the natural exposure to an antigen. Active artificial immunity, which is vaccinations. Um, so the deliberate exposure to an antigen in the form of a vaccine. You have passive natural immunity, which is the transfer of antibodies from a mother to her fetus or baby. So whether that is through the mother's blood, um, the passage through the vaginal canal, or through breast milk. Um, 
Passive artificial immunity is the transfer of antibodies or cells from an immune animal to a non-immune human. And then you get this term anti-serum, which is the injection uh, responsible for passive artificial immunity. These types of, this last one, this passive artificial immunity, um, are available uh, for rabies, hepatitis, and measles. Um, the toxins formed by bacteria such as tetanus, uh, diphtheria, and botulism. Uh, venoms from poisonous snakes and black widow spiders are also an example of the anti-serum that you can get and uh, thus uh, help with the passive artificial immunity. So that is um, things that you can essentially be given after you've already been infected by um, whatever it is. So let's say that uh, you got bit by a poisonous snake. Um, the venom is now rushing through you in a way. Um, there is an anti-serum for quite a few um, venomous snakes. Um, so as long as you are given that anti-serum, you're going to get that passive artificial immunity uh, after you have already been exposed to that infection, if that makes sense. And then here is, again, a really lovely way to kind of organize all of that information. Um, if this helps, I'm a visual learner. I find this to be a very nice way to present the information from that last slide in a little bit easier to read way. So if you need to pause, go ahead and pause. And then we have an overview of our immune interactions. So the major inner actions and responsive responses, excuse me, uh, of innate and adaptive immunity to an antigen are all included on this uh, lovely, very concise uh, overview of immune interactions. And then one of the last topics we're going to talk about is immunotherapy. Um, Immunotherapy is treating a disease by altering the immune system function or directly attacking, attacking harmful cells. Uh, this is usually done in an attempt to boost the immune system function in general, uh, and it can involve activation or in inhibition of the immune system to accomplish that. A few examples is the administration of cytokines, uh, the use of monoclonal antibodies to target tumors, uh, and monoclonal antibodies in checkpoint therapy. And then last, but certainly not least, let's talk about uh, the effects of aging on the lymphatic system and um, your immune system. So there is little effect on the ability of lymphatic system to remove fluid from tissues, although it can happen. And again, um, some people are more prone to edemas. You can live with an edema as long as it's not absolutely just detrimental in the areas that uh, it's occurring. Um, but a lot of people uh, retain more fluid in their legs, it seems, as well as sometimes in their arms and hands. As you age, your thymus will atrophy. Um, this means that you just lose the ability to produce new T cells. Um, remember, hit 60, and that's when the thymus starts kind of uh, uh, not functioning the way that it should. Your primary and secondary responses also decrease as you get older. So being introduced to a new infection, um, you will not be able to handle it quite as well. More antigens are going to, um, you're going to require more antigens um, to, to, to oh, I'm losing the ability to talk, I'm so sorry, it's the last slide. To produce a response, it will be slower, you'll have less antibodies, and fewer memory cells uh, will be produced. The ability of cell-mediated immunity to resist intracellular pathogens will also decrease. An example of this is influenza. And then last uh, on this slide, the reactivation of path pathogens, uh, such as with this example, which is actually pretty, pretty common and well known, is if you had childhood chicken pox um, as an adult, if that virus shows up again, if you get reintroduced to that virus, it will cause shingles. And shingles is 
um, I've heard absolutely horrific to experience. It's, it's very, very painful. It's not like chicken pox. It is like chicken pox times a hundred and you can die from shingles. Not good. Not good at all. So there is the immune system. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day or evening or whatever time you are listening to this and, um, good luck on your quizzes and exam.